Hello and welcome to this lecture on validity and selection testing. Validity is a topic that is sometimes hard to get a handle on. However, I think I can help you understand it just a little bit better. Let's get started. This is the basic formula for a validity coefficient. It is the degree to which available evidence supports inferences made from scores on selection measures. And this formula shows that the relationship between two variables noted here as x and y, and their relationship is noted as r sub xy, is equal to the square root of the cross product of the two variables x and y's reliability. Now remember in a previous lecture when I stated that reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity, this formula shows why. If the reliability of either x or y is zero, then the area under the square root symbol reduces to zero, and the relationship between x and y is therefore zero. As the reliability of x and y approach a value of 1.0, then the relationship between x and y is maximized. Now, to be clear, this formula shows the maximum value of the correlation between x and y. This relationship is hampered greatly or enhanced greatly if high levels of reliability exist for scores on X and Y. Of course, there are other factors which contribute to whether or not X and Y are correlated, or in other words, if X is a valid predictor of the criterion Y. Let's move on. There are many, many types of validity. Here are some of the major types that are used in human resource management. But before we get into the main subtypes, Let's get a definition of it. Validity represents the strength of the relationship between scores and a thing, or between scores on two things. The, the key is that validity is about relationships and about scores. This relationship was explored briefly on the last slide when I showed you that the relationship between scores on two things is limited by the reliability of scores on those two things. Okay, before your eyes glaze over, let's look at the taxonomic structure of validity briefly here and in separate slides on the slides to follow. Construct validity at the very top answers the following questions. Does this thing exist? Can we measure it? And do we know how it relates to other things? This is the overarching type of validity that is of utmost concern. Next, we have convergent and discriminant validity. Convergent validity answers the question, to what degree do measures of this variable correlate with measures of similar variables? Discriminant validity answers the question, to what degree are measures of this variable different from measures of theoretically different variables. Next, we turn to criterion-related or empirical validity, as it is sometimes known. For criterion-related validity, we ask, what is the degree of association between the predictor and the criterion? There are two subtypes of criterion-related validity, predictive and concurrent. For predictive validity, we ask, to what degree do measures on this test predict job performance later. Concurrent validity answers the question, to what degree do measures on this test given today measure job performance as measured today? Lastly, on this short and abbreviated list is content validity, which is not the same as face validity. Content validity asks, to what degree are these test items indicative of the thing being measured? In this course, the thing being measured is job performance and various predictors of it. Face validity answers the question, do these things on the test appear to measure what they are supposed to measure on their face? Okay, that was a very short, sweet overview of the taxonomic structure of validity. Let's explore each of these types of validity in greater detail on the following slides. Let's move on. Now, as I said, in layperson's terms, construct validity answers the questions, does it exist? Do we know how to measure it? And how does it relate to other constructs? 
well, I, I haven't even defined a construct yet. A construct is often referred to as a latent construct. Latent means unobservable. The construct part refers to a concept or characteristic or ability or skill or something else worth measuring. Some examples include intelligence, conscientiousness, self-esteem. We know that these things exist, but they are latent because they are not directly observable. You cannot see, taste, or smell intelligence, conscientiousness, or self-esteem. Additionally, we definitely know how to measure those things. We most often use self-report tests or scales or questionnaires or inventories, if you will, to measure them. We have the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test, the IPIP Conscientiousness Scale. We have Rosenberg's Self-Esteem Scale, amongst many, many other measures of these three constructs. Construct validity is the overarching type of validity that includes the various subtypes on the previous slide and which will be discussed in detail in this lecture. It is noteworthy that we can never ever claim that a test is valid or a test has been validated. What we can claim is that there is evidence of its validity. We must always strive to continually collect more and more validity evidence. However, as a sort of verbal shorthand, we tend to colloquially refer to tests as valid or as having been validated. Just remember that psychometric purists will always disagree with you when you make such a statement. Let's move on. Now, you've heard me use the term correlation repeatedly in this series of video lectures. And that's because a correlation is the key statistic used in HR selection. Sometimes it's referred to as a validity coefficient. Now, some of you may only have a cursory understanding of what a correlation is, while others of you may be able to explain the difference between the Pearson R, Kendall's Tau, and Spearman's Rho, which are all different forms of a correlation. We don't necessarily need to understand the various types of correlations right now, but we definitely need to understand the basic form of a correlation. In fact, much of what follows on validity depends upon a thorough understanding of correlations. So, the term correlation is a general term that refers to a variety of statistics, which include the aforementioned special cases of correlations. There are also point by serial correlations, which are the relationship between a nominal variable and an interval or, or, or ratio variable. There's the tetrachoric correlation, which is a relationship between two nominal variables. And of course, the old standby, the Pearson product moment correlation, which is the relationship between two variables, both of which are measured with interval or ratio scales. Now, more specifically, a correlation measures the strength of the relationship between two variables. And we can use either of two types of analysis for correlations, correlational analysis and bivariate regression analysis. We'll see this overview of correlation in this lecture, and we'll cover bivariate regression and its extension, multiple regression, in the video lecture on making decisions in selection testing. Now, a correlation has two characteristics, its direction and its magnitude. So its direction is determined by its sign. It's either positive or negative. Its magnitude is determined by how far away from zero it is, how far negative or positive it is. So the correlation symbol is the lowercase letter r. And on this slide, we see the implications of direction and magnitude. And a correlation ranges from positive one to negative one. If it is positive, it indicates that as one variable increases, so does the other. If it's perfectly positive, then R equals exactly one. And for every one unit increase in X, we have an exact one unit increase in Y. That's exceedingly rare, but it is the upper limit of the correlation coefficient. If it's perfectly negatively correlated, then R equals negative one. And for every one unit increase in X, we have an exact one unit decrease in Y. That, too, 
is rare and simply serves as the lower boundary of R. If R equals zero, then there is no relationship at all between X and Y. If we compute the correlation between two random sets of numbers, R should equal zero. It's not so rare at all to have R equals zero. For example, the correlation between attitudes toward the color blue and preference for flavor of ice cream are probably not correlated at all. And therefore, for them, R equals zero. Let's move on. Okay, you didn't think I would venture too far from formulae, did you? This monstrosity of a formula is actually quite simple and explains how to calculate a correlation. You find the mean of x denoted as x bar above, and the mean of y denoted as y bar above. In the sample, you subtract each observation of x from the mean of x, and each observation of y from the mean of y. Each of these differences is called a deviation. You then multiply the deviations and add them all up with one cross product of the deviations for each observation in the sample. You then divide the cross products of the two deviations by the value of n minus 1, where n is the sample size. Now, what value serves as the average of the cross product of the x and y deviations is your numerator. For the denominator, you just plug and chug the same values calculated for the numerator with a few squares here and there, and then a square root of the whole denominator. You need to explore this in greater detail to get a better understanding of a correlation. Try it yourself with some numbers that you just make up. Pick 10 pairs of numbers with one part of each pair indicating an X value and the other part indicating a Y value. And with only 10 pairs, you should be able to calculate the correlation by hand. Then double check your work in Excel or SPSS. It will show you what's actually going on in the calculation of a correlation. It's important. Let's move on. Okay, so here we have a perfect negative correlation. What's the value of R here? Negative one. Here is a very strong, but not perfect positive correlation. You can see that almost all of the observations noted by green dots are on or very near the line. The dots would all have to fall perfectly on the line for R to equal positive one. But this is a really strong correlation anyway. Here we have a zero correlation where R equals zero. If we want to draw a line through these dots to best capture them, it might be completely vertical or completely horizontal or slanted upward or slanted downward or any variation thereof. For every value of X, there are numerous values of Y. Look at the horizontal axis with X. Look at this value of X, numerous values of Y. Look at this value of X, numerous values of Y. There simply is no relationship between X and Y in this graph. The same thing goes for y. For this value of y, there are numerous values of x, etc. This correlation is effectively zero. Let's move on. Now, if you recall, I had stated previously that a correlation coefficient is sometimes referred to as a validity coefficient. That is because, if you recall again, validity is about relationships. Well, what happens when we square a correlation coefficient? Well, a squared correlation is called a coefficient of determination and represents the proportion of variance or variability in one variable that's explained or associated with another variable. While we most often refer to the two variables in a correlation as X and Y, to some, it might appear that we are using X to predict Y we sort of are in HR selection. However, you've probably heard the old adage that correlation is not causality. That means that just about, just because two variables are correlated, we cannot necessarily claim that one causes the other. So technically a bivariate correlation for X and Y is the same 
as a correlation between y and x. Again, and I can't say this enough, the proportion of total variance in one variable shared with or explained by another variable is the coefficient of determination, which is simply r squared. Now, the conditions which are necessary for an inference of causality are as follows. First, the two variables must be related. Well, that makes sense. They're not related. One can't cause the other. All that really means is that there must be some non-zero correlation between the two. Second, the predictor must temporarily precede the criterion that is preceded in time. That is, the cause must, must come uh, before the effect in a time sequence. And third, there must not be any other variable responsible for the shared variance between the two variables. Shared variance is what the coefficient of determination is all about. This third part of inferring causality is the one which can almost never be proven. Thus, we do not prove causality. We simply make a strong or a weak or somewhere in between inference of causality. We hope that our predictor can overlap or explain much of the variability when possible. Thus, we will use R squared to note that. Let's move on. Okay, so here's a Venn diagram of the coefficient of determination. Suppose that we have a variable named x1, represented by the green circle. We have another variable known as x2, represented by the purple circle. Now let's put some names and numbers to this example. Suppose that x1 is age and x2 is job tenure and their correlation is 0.45. Now that should make sense that as an employee's tenure goes up, their age also goes up. However, we don't usually hire people when they're 18 and they stay with us until they're 65. Sometimes the 18 year olds quit. Sometimes we hire people who are say 42 and have only been with us for a year or two. It's not a perfect positive correlation, but it is reasonable that it might actually be about 0.45. Now, when you square the correlation of 0.45, you get 0.2025. Now, visually, this area of overlap is 0.2025, or just slightly more than 20%. We can say that age shares slightly over 20% of its variance or variability with tenure and vice versa. Remember that one is not the cause and the other is not the effect. They're just correlated. Now here's another example we can do in our head. If r sub xy, that is the correlation between x and y is equal to 0.5, then r squared is 0.25 which is equal to 25%. That is, they overlap by 25%. So here's another example. If two variables correlate at 0.9, then R squared is 0.81. That is, those two variables share 81% of their variance, and the two circles sit almost on top of each other, but not exactly. Let's move on. So we can see here that r squared is a function of the explained variance over the total variance, noted here as sum of squares explained, sum of squares total, and here sum of squares regression. We'll come back to this formula at the end of the semester when we talk more about multiple regression. This is the very foundation of classical test theory described in an earlier video. Remember that the explained variance is the area of overlap between the two variables. It can never be more than 1.0 or 100%. Usually, it is much, much less than one in the social and behavioral sciences, since so many other things are partly responsible for explaining variability in any dependent variable, particularly in one like job performance. So here we see that r squared is equal to the sum of squares regression divided by the sum of squares total. Well, the sum of squares total is sum of squares regression and sum of squares error. Or we can rework the formula so that it is 1 minus sum of squares error divided by sum of squares total. Hopefully this makes sense. Let's move on. Convergent and discriminant validity 
are thought of as opposites. When we are developing a new measure of something, we need to make sure that it is related to the same or similar things and unrelated to things that it should not be related to. Let's take, for example, a new selection test that measures workplace tidiness. Suppose that the manufacturing plant that you work for is very concerned about workplace accidents and wants to make sure that new hires have a keen sense of tidiness and orderliness. Now let's assess convergent validity. The goal is that our measure of tidiness should be strongly positively or negatively correlated to things that are very similar or very opposite of tidiness, respectively. We know that conscientiousness is composed of diligence, perseverance, organization, and willingness to work hard. That sort of sounds like tidiness. So we would expect a positive correlation between scores on our test of tidiness and scores on a conscientiousness test. We also know that counterproductive work behavior, or CWB, involves sloppiness, absenteeism, not working to one's potential, etc. We should find that scores on our tidiness measure are negatively correlated with scores on a measure of CWB. Here's another example. Suppose that we know of an off-the-shelf copyrighted instrument designed to measure tidiness, but it's expensive. We buy enough copies to administer it to people and also administer our newly developed measure of tidiness and hope that there is a strong positive correlation between the two. If there is, then we may have some evidence that our measure developed in-house and much more cheaply can be used instead of the expensive off-the-shelf instrument. Next, we turn to discriminant validity. To assess this type of validity, we must administer our test of tidiness with another test of something thought to be completely unrelated to it. Suppose that we administer a, the scale called attitude toward the color blue. The correlation between scores on our in-house developed measure of tidiness and ATCB or attitude toward the color blue should be zero. That provides us with some evidence of the validity of our measure of tidiness some evidence. The journey has just begun though. Let's move on. Now I turn to content validity and face validity, which are much less statistical by their very nature and should be more easily understandable. Content validity is a subjective assessment of whether or not the test items are part of the job. Face validity is also subjectively determined. You can put a number on content validity, and you can kind of calculate the percentage agreement amongst various raters of the items in the test. Now, remember that in HR selection, everything is a test. Let's say we give an actual paper and pencil test of mechanical comprehension to applicants for the job of maintenance person at a small apartment complex. Further, let's say the test has a lot of questions regarding the use of pulleys, but also some about European history. The questions about the pulleys indicate that the test is appropriate for mechanical comprehension, but the questions about European history may not be content valid. Understanding pulleys is essential to mechanical comprehension, but having questions on the test about the history of, say, France is unrelated to mechanical comprehension. So to assess content validity, we need to get the opinions of several subject matter experts or SMEs. Remember, it's a subjective assessment, so opinions are really all that we have. We should say uh, five SMEs, with five SMEs, looking at the 50 items in the test of mechanical comp comprehension, only five of which are on history. We hope that all SMEs rate the mechanical comprehension items as appropriate and all of them rate the history questions as inappropriate. We can compute the percentage agreement or one of the various inter or intra-class reliability coefficients. The key thing is that the test must adequately cover all aspects of a topic and not include unrelated topics. However, this is not the same thing as face validity. Face validity is assessed also subjectively by non-expert test takers.
If we give a mechanical comprehension test to applicants for the job of a mechanic, some of them might object to the questions on geography or history or whatever else is included in the test that does not cover mechanical comprehension. Of course, face validity is important sometimes. Sometimes we need to disguise the true purpose of the test. We'll talk about that in the lecture on counterproductive work behavior with a specific focus on integrity testing. But here's a heads up. If we simply ask applicants questions like, have you ever stolen from an employer? Have you ever spoken poorly of a coworker behind their back? We'll probably get answers of no and hell no. In order to tap into integrity in a roundabout way, we can actually measure personality traits that are strongly correlated with integrity. These traits include self-deception, impression management, humility, but more on that later. On their face, they may not look like they're measuring integrity to the test takers, but to the SMEs, they probably are. Therefore, content and face validity can be very different to experts and to test takers, respectively. Let's move on. Here's an example of face validity. Both of these tests attempt to measure spatial visualization. The one on the left is called the flight apperception test, and the one on the right is called the Purdue visualization of rotation test. Now, if you were the next Top Gun Tom Cruise, which test would be more acceptable to you? I suspect that you would think that the one on the left would be a better predictor of how well you fly a plane, but actually both predict aspects of piloting a plane quite well. Of course, I've omitted the instructions and the questions that accompany each test, but the naive non-expert test taker would probably wonder why they got the question on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, but be very comfortable with the one on the right. Let's move on. Okay, now I'll explain criterion related validity and its two subtypes. Of course, there are some requirements that I should alert you to in gathering evidence of either type of validity. The construct should be reasonably stable and not in a period of change or transition. Now, in the HR selection world, that means several things. First, the predictor must be stable. That is, we don't want to use fleeting transitory states as predictors. We would not use anger or happiness as predictors because they change from day to day and sometimes from minute to minute. Second, the criterion must be stable. That is, the nature of what it is to perform a job must not be in a state of flux. Third, and related quite heavily to the second caveat just mentioned, is that the job itself must be stable. If what one does in a job changes from week to week, then the nature of the job changes, and so does the measurement of job performance, and frankly, so should the predictors of it. For example, if one week you are an intermediate accountant, and the next week you are a civil engineer, and the third week you are a janitor, it's intuitively understandable that how we predict job performance and those three very different occupations should also be different. A relevant, reliable criterion that is free from contamination must be available or feasible to develop. Criterion contamination is a big problem, and it arises, as we know, when we measure things that should not be measured. The criterion for, say, an accountant is contaminated when we also include the dollar value and number of customer returns for products. That's not part of their job performance. They're not responsible in the ordinary completion of their accountant duties for customer returns, so their performance should not be measured on it. It must be possible to base the validation study on a sample of people and jobs that are representative of people and jobs to which the results will be generalized. This, aided this is aided substantially by using a large enough sample of people on whom both predictor and criterion data have been collected. Big samples have less error. Big samples are good. So the first subtype is concurrent validity. Now in the HR selection world, 
we would conduct a concurrent validity study on a test that we hope to someday use on job applicants. Here's how it's done. The test must be validated on current employees. We would administer our new test to a current group of employees, and then we would look at their previous or their current job performance. In other words, we already have a measure of job performance for current employees, and we give a test to them and see if the correlation between their test scores and their job performance scores are strong and positive. If it is, then we might consider later using it on our job applicants, but probably after some additional psychometric examinations are conducted. Predictive validity simply uses test scores now to predict job performance later. So we might take that same test on which we had collected evidence of concurrent validity and then administer it to job applicants. Then six months after hiring some of them, we'd look at the correlation between their test scores six months previously as applicants and their job performance now as employees. We'd hope that the correlation was strong and positive. The only thing that differs between concurrent and predictive validity is the amount of time that spans between the measurement of the predictor or the X variable and the measurement of the criterion or Y variable. That's it. Let's move on. So years ago, ago, companies thought that their employees were all special and different and that if you found a correlation between, say, integrity test scores and employee theft for your employees, that that correlation would not hold up on employees in different jobs at different companies. They were very wrong. Because of validity generalization, we are able to determine if scores on a particular test generalize to other jobs in other situations for other persons and other organizations. That is, we can determine if the validity of a test in predicting job performance generalizes to other jobs and companies. Validity generalization is a technique that seeks to find the so-called true score correlation between the constructs. It seeks to determine, more specifically, what is the actual true and generalizable correlation between scores on test X and scores on behavior Y. So validity generalization makes use of meta-analysis, which is a statistical technique that attempts to overcome some of the statistical artifacts or holdovers or problems in the primary studies. And a primary study is a study that's published in the scientific literature through peer review that uses original data collected specifically for that study. A meta-analysis synthesizes existing literature and makes use of dozens or even hundreds of primary studies. So meta-analysis is the analysis of analysis. In order to conduct a meta-analysis, you have to find all extant studies on a particular bivariate relationship. In the HR selection context, we would need to find all studies that some measured some measure of job performance. Remember that all selection tests seek to predict job performance. So what the heck is the statistical artifact I mentioned? It's a statistical factor that affects the aforementioned bivariate relationships between a selection test and job performance. Remember the very first slide in this presentation. It showed that the upper limit on a correlation is a function of the reliability of the two variables in the correlation. So these statistical artifacts include things like predictor unreliability. An unreliable predictor attenuates the validity of the relationship between the variables. Attenuation is a dampening or a weakening or a lessening of the strength of a relationship. In this case, poor reliability of a predictor can lessen a correlation between a selection test and job performance from, say, 0.4 to 0.3 or some such. Criterion unreliability. This is the same issues as predictor unreliability, but it's probably more common of a problem than predictor unreliability because most managers do such a poor job of measuring job performance. This is partly due to the fact that so many performance appraisals are done completely subjectively. 
and subjectivity opens it up to all sorts of contamination issues. Sampling error is another artifact that meta-analysis seeks to correct. In fact, it's the primary artifact that we try and fix. Now, I say we because I've published a few of them in peer-reviewed scientific literature. The problem is that small sample sizes have large standard errors and are not always representative of the population. Think about it for a moment. If we're trying to meta-analyze the relationship between human height and human weight, and one sample had 50 people in it, and another had 500 or 5,000, it makes sense that the small sample would be more predisposed to error. For example, what if the sample of 50 were strangers that we encountered on a street corner? They would have a very different correlation between their height and weight than a sample of, say, 5,000 military inductees. So, to correct this meta-analysis, we would use a sample size weighted average. In this example, if the correlation between height and weight in the small sample was 0.9 and in the large sample was 0.3, we wouldn't say that the average correlation between these two samples was simply 0.6, right in the middle of 0.3 and 0.9. The small sample is weighted by an N, a sample size of 50, and the other sample is weighted by an N of 5,000. The sample size weighted average correlation is far less than 0.6. It's actually only 0.309, which is a lot closer to the score for the sample of 5,000 to, than to the sample of 50. Now, range restriction is another artifact. Most research on selection tests suffers from not having all who took a selection test being hired, and therefore later having their performance appraised. Since we only hire the best scorers, we have restricted the range of outcomes. In other words, we expect high performance because we only selected the high scorers on the selection test. Think for a moment about the personality trait of emotional stability. We don't tend to hire emotionally unstable persons. Since only the most stable people get hired, the correlation between emotional stability and job performance is going to be statistically limited. Let's move on. Suppose that we are pleased with our assessment of convergent, discriminant, concurrent, predictive content, and face validity. Well, when we administer a selection test, there are four different outcomes that we can have. The first is a true positive. That is, we hire someone who we think will perform the job well, and ta-da, they perform the job well. This is what we are striving for in selection testing. This is the goal. The second is a true negative. We predict that, we will, that they will not perform the job, and ta-da, wait a minute, no ta-da. We don't know if they'll perform the job well later or not because they don't get hired. But if we did hire them anyway and they actually don't perform well, then we'd have a true negative. Sometimes in tight economic conditions, we have to hire people that otherwise may not so-called make the cut. This is not uncommon in times of war with regard to military recruits. We might have to lower the standards a bit to get enough soldiers. And we can later determine that those who scored poorly on the selection test or standards actually went on to not perform well as a soldier. A false positive, which is also known as a type 1 error, is when we thought the applicant would perform the job well, but sadly they did not. We falsely predicted they would be good, but they were actually bad. We'll explore type 1 and type 2 errors in greater detail on the next slide, so stay tuned. And lastly, we have a false negative. This occurs when we predict that they will not perform well, but then they actually do perform well. However, if we predicted they would not perform well, then we don't hire them. So we'll never actually know if they succeeded in the job or not. They weren't hired. This is the risk of letting good candidates get away. Let's move on. Here's a graphic representation of the information on the last slide. False positives, true negatives, etc. Oddly, when we hypothesize about a statistic, we are technically testing whether or not the statistic is equal to zero, or the effect is equal to zero. 
so we're testing the so-called null hypothesis we want the null to be false if our hypothesis is, is confirmed we want the hypothesis that there is no relationship at all between a predictor and a criterion to be false so let's look at this two by two matrix and try and make some sense of it so if we accept the fact that null is true in our sample that is there is no relationship between a predictor and a criterion and in fact it is true in the population then we have not made an error our hypothesis is correct similarly if we hypothesize that the null is false that is that there is some non-zero relationship between x and y which is usually the case both in research and selection testing and we find that it is actually is false then again we have not made an error and our hypothesis was correct now let's turn to the issue of making errors suppose that the null is actually true that no relationship exists between x and y in our data but we've in the data but we find that in our sample it is false that is we reject the null and we've made a serious error let's try and restrict that uh, restate that in some plain english we expect that nothing exists but we find that it does exist this is a mistake this is a type one error this is like pardon the analogy like hanging an innocent man our defendant was innocent but we found him guilty in truth there was no relationship between the defendant and the crime but we found that there was a relationship this is bad this is very bad our legal system is so keen to not falsely convict a suspect that we will go to great lengths to prove their guilt beyond all reasonable doubt all reasonable doubt we simply do not want to send innocent people to jail or to the gallows a type 2 error occurs when the null is false in the population but we accept it in our sample we accept the null in the sample in other words when there is a relationship that is the null is false in reality or in the population that we should find but we just don't find it it's bad but it's not as bad as hanging an innocent man in this case it's like letting a guilty man go free the suspect is guilty but he gets off free it's also an error it should be at least partially obvious to you that type 1 and type 2 error are related now back to our system of jurisprudence in the u.s we are so keen not to convict an innocent person that some guilty people get off free think about oj simpson for that one let's move on well thanks that's all folks